A big thank you to Barbara and Chris for that fascinating insight into insurance and its digital transformation. And now, ever since the, the blockchain white paper first appeared, there has been a debate about how to fulfill the vision that Satoshi outlined in it. A vision of a world with decentralized but trustworthy financial transactions. This vision of cutting out third parties has proven difficult and contentious. Various parties have emerged to claim to know how best to achieve it. Ladies and gentlemen, in conversation with Mike Butcher, editor at large of TechCrunch, is the father of digital cash and the founder of the most recent claimant to the throne of Satoshi's vision, Elixir's David Schaum. Gentlemen, please join me on stage. Got some water there. Excellent. Marvellous. We're all sorted. Hello, everybody. How are you today? Having a good time? How's it all going? Um, my name is Mike Butcher. I'm with uh, TechCrunch. Uh, at 4 p.m. today, you can come and pitch me by the BMW, and we'll have a, an informal pitch. Yeah? <laughs> cool. 4, 4 p.m. today by the BMW. David. Hey. It's great to see you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Fantastic. And to be, be at Web Summit, I, my favorite conference of all time. <laughs> Absolutely. It's amazing. Now, um, let's, what I want to do right now is I want to kind of take you back in time a little bit. Um, you uh, were, what I think is really uh, fascinating about you is that you created arguably the first blockchain in 1982. Round of applause, everybody. <laughs> Come on. Um, yeah, it's... And um, in the 1990s, you were the CEO inventor of DigiCash, uh, the first ever real digital cash solution. Um, and you've also been, you've had a distinguished career in academia as well. Um, what do you make of it all today? Well, to me, I think we are actually poised to make it all actually happen for the first time uh, at a consumer scale, and so at, at, a, at a real level. I think blockchain has created a tremendous amount of energy that's you know, based on the Satoshi uh, work, but now is kind of a pent up energy that we can use to take something to a global consumer product. And I think all the elements are kind of teed up for that, so this is a moment in time. What's your, um, what's your sort of perspective, though? I mean, we've seen an enormous amount of activity in the last uh, couple of years. Obviously, Bitcoin has been around for, well, 10 years, the 10th year anniversary. Um, but really, let's face it, I think it, the mainstream adoption of it started, let's be honest, probably last year. And so we really are very early in all of, uh, in, in terms of adoption of, of crypto, and also very early in the adoption of blockchain technologies. Um, but uh, I mean, one of the, the key issues is, is mainstream adoption. What are sure. some of the things, thoughts you have about how that might happen? Well, it's kind of why I came back into the field, because I think we're now ready to move to mainstream use of blockchain and it can kind of change everything. There are some key requirements that have to be met and so far blockchain technologies haven't have wanted to achieve them but have not been able to even come close uh, to uh, any say even two of the four key requirements like speed, you should be able to make a payment in 10, 15 seconds, send a message. 10, 15 seconds, all of your payments and messaging activities shouldn't be transparently visible on the blockchain. That's not a consumer product. And then, of course, current blockchains really, truth be told, are unable to scale to hundreds of thousands or even the millions of transactions a second that would be needed for the combination of messaging and payments, which consumers have demonstrated is the killer app and all the, you know, 
WeChat and the messaging platforms are all desperately trying to include uh, payments now. I mean, that's what people want is messaging integrated with payments and uh, at a consumer scale that, that has a final dimension which hasn't really been recognized and addressed yet fully and that is that countries aren't really looking forward to having other countries provide their payments and messaging infrastructure for them. So blockchain is the only way to provide an infrastructure that allows a player, fair playing field for all actors in any country. I presume you mean things like um, the use of Tencent in Japan, for instance, or uh, things like that. So blockchain is much more obviously, I mean, crypto is a much more international methodology. But let me just sort of um, dig into some of the things you said there. Sure, sure. The scaling issue. Um, what's your opinion about whether or not Ethereum can become the, you know, the one blockchain to rule them all, as they say? Well, I think, I think the scaling is a, a key issue, and I wouldn't have come back into this space if I, if I didn't have good intelligence on what was being planned and how these chains were planning to improve their performance and so on. And truth be told, I don't think there's a lot of optimism at any level in the community that the kind of scaling that would be needed to do payments in, in Japan even, let alone globally, uh, is, is in the cards for, for the existing uh, you, technologies. So you've come back um, with your own solution, Elixir. Yes. Um, you're obviously bullish about that. It's, um, it's actually now been uh, funded by one of the founders of Ripple um, and uh, David Lawson. So Chris, Chris Larson. Larson. Chris Larson. Yeah. So yeah, he's not only a founder of Ripple, he's a, been an advocate of privacy and yeah. uh, uh, trying to make the world a better place with consumer lending and all that for, for, for the longest time. So what, tell, us what, tell us what Elixir is. You said it, you told me backstage it's running in the lab, that it's scalable. What are, the, what are the fundamental key components of it that why you, you're coming back to create this thing called Elixir? Well, it's payments and messaging integrated on, that can run on smartphone platform just like any smartphone app, but with blockchain inside. So it, it has the performance uh, and the scalability and this national laboratory level of security that, that's wanted. And like I said, those, those are the ingredients that are needed to take blockchain mainstream. And I think once that occurs for these killer apps, then all the so-called decentralized apps, the dApps, that's sort of the next uh, level, uh, will, will have a platform that they can run on, just like we've seen dApps running on the smartphone, apps running on the smartphone. So is it, is it going to be more of a protocol or more of a dApp? Well, Elixir is a full stack. Uh, blockchain that goes for, from a, actually a lower level than current blockchains, so includes DDoS and uh, if you're the uh, kind of uh, secure push to, to mobile uh, that no one else has really addressed. That's not, okay, I've, maybe I'm speaking out of school here, that, uh, that's not actually in our public uh, disclosure, but all the way up to uh, uh, smartphone uh, apps, so the APIs and all that have been running for some time, and uh, so it it all, it all works without like impinging on your data plan or your battery usage and it, it runs fast enough that it's, it seems like a normal consumer app but with all the advantages of blockchain. So it, it's the first system that protects against metadata analysis and messaging, much more secure than any security uh, messaging platform and we don't need you know to charge a merchant discount so it has a certain advantage in the uh, Consumer payment space. It's a is it going to be a proof of a proof of work blockchain? Correct. So we're not going to have uh, actual uh, mining as a, a basis for it. It's, it's more more like Dash EOS in that uh, we'll so just create a small number of additional of, coins. Closer to inflation. proof of stake, as it as it were. Is yes. It closer. Yes. Because it and, and is it is fully decentralized or is it is it Central or centralized? How, how decentralized is it? <laughs> well, you know, 
like we were talking about backstage let's, let's a little keep, bit, Mike. Let's go with it, it's, this is the key issue is decentralization. And I think that when you can decentralize across countries, that's really important. I, I saw a video of myself from the mid 90s in which I was advocating decentralization. Um, the, the software which I open sourced in the early 80s for mixing was a way to decentralize uh, control over, over uh, packet switch networks. So I think that decentralization has been the key issue all along. And now with blockchain finally and the smartphone, sort of the consumers and the people and the IT professionals have the, the power to, to, to make it happen and actually decentralize all the key uh, controlling aspects of, of information technology, and which is the, provides the structure for the digital world. So sort of unleashing our creativity to uh, build a digital future for ourselves. So you're going to be building this thing, which is uh, a, 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 a deeper protocol, deep protocol messaging app, smartphone based, uh, decentralized, sounds closer to proof of stake, a little bit more proof of stake than proof of work. Uh, I'm, I'm sure when you, when you launch next year, we'll find out much more. Um, and it's in the labs right now. You've got it running in the labs. But, yes. but you, obviously, you've been enormous um, uh, proponent of this for, throughout your entire career. And, yes. Um, but also, I want to know a little bit more about you know, the conversations you might have had in those early days. Were you on the chats with Satoshi at the time? Well, I, I, I'd rather not, not comment on that, but, uh, you know, Why not? I've known a lot of key people in the, in the, in the field for, since the beginning. I mean, I have been said to, like, I guess at the very least inspire the whole uh, uh, movement. And I think, you know, even though I was operating in a kind of academic environment, yeah. uh, I created most of the key memes that have been percolating around and moving all this forward over three or three and a half decades. That's a, it's a pity to have to say so. <laughs> what, um, are you, do you feel that um, we're ever going to be able to get back to that original Satoshi white paper? Uh, or do you feel that, um, uh, that uh, the whole conversation has moved on? Well, I think that Satoshi white paper was a key milestone and it it really laid out a fundamental vision of decentralization where everyone's own computer was participating in a, uh, a level playing field of, as an equal uh, partner uh, with everyone else that is the, you know the basis for the next the next level. Unfortunately, Bitcoin didn't really turn out that way because some smart guys found out they could make ASICs that would uh, mine a lot faster than your home computer, and then we got a kind of uh, imbalance developing. But right. uh, the original vision uh, lives on, and I think this next generation will allow us to achieve that basis, and then open it up to everyone to build. I think, I think what I think is also there's a theme running through your career, which is you're very interested, very passionate about privacy, data privacy. Yes. Um, and that, and you've, you were telling me earlier that Elixir is going to have a, a, quite a large component of that. What do you think of projects like Zcash, uh, which are very privacy oriented? And, um, and wh where do you think that conversation about uh, privacy in crypto is going to be going in the next few years? Well, I think privacy is generally recognized as the key issue uh, for blockchain, both because dApps can't provide it and because there seems to be a sort of an inverse relationship between current privacy-oriented pay uh, blockchain-based payments and scalability. Um, consumers obviously don't want to have every single 
payment detail transparently, immutably, archived in perpetuity on the blockchain. So you need some level of privacy if you want to address scale for, uh, for at a consumer level. I think once, and once you have a consumer scale deployment, then regulation will just sort of move to accommodate and, and almost lock it in. I mean, you look at the history of financial services innovation over decades, it's always the same story on a more or less kind of like two-year frame. New things come up, you wonder if they're legal, a lot of people start using them, then next thing you know, it's, it's the new legal. The, the, uh, one, of the, one of the issues about cryptocurrency is the scrutiny of uh, the SEC in the United States. Uh, you're based in LA. Um, what's going to happen, do you think, with uh, many more blockchain projects becoming very sort of privacy oriented? Do you think that uh, governments are going to get, start to get upset about that kind of thing? No, I think that privacy in the consumer payment space already exists, it's, it's, it's necessary. It's gonna, would be very hard to extract that from Western democracies, populations, and it's not really a fundamental issue for criminal use, criminal operations or terrorism or something. I mean, moving large amounts of money around, uh, that's a different matter and it's kinda, you know, there's an awful lot of, most of the US $100 bills are offshore and we don't know where they are and they're probably up to no good. And, you know, you can move a little envelope of uncut diamonds around pretty easily. You don't see them on an x-ray machine when you walk through the, uh, the airport. So I oh, think- Oh, is that how you do it? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, that's not, so, you know, the, the consumer payments is a, is a whole different uh, matter. You have to have uh, privacy and I, th I don't think that's gonna be, in fact, a, an issue when this stuff uh, scales. You, you have to have it in order for it to scale. It'll never be picked up by consumers if it, it doesn't have it. And once it's deployed at consumer scale with privacy, it's a done deal. You'll never take it back. What sort of, what do you think is going to happen? Give us, if we were having this conversation in a year's time, you, will, you guys will have launched. What will the world look like then? I think that sophisticated financial services will be available much more broadly to the you know, billion plus people who have a smartphone and no bank account. I think that pe kids will be developing, instead of apps, they'll be developing dApps, and instead of only getting a small percentage of the proceeds, they'll, they'll be able to take all the revenue from it. With all, you know, the idea of token-based investment as opposed to corporate uh, securities will, you know, so the users having investment in these, the, act, the enterprises that they're supporting will, probably pull ahead. It's, it's gonna be a different uh, landscape and hopefully the beginning of a, a world where individuals are em empowered to not only protect their own assets and their own ideas and their own keys and their own rights informationally, but to express themselves and to form uh, secure uh, groups in which they can communicate and, and support each other and okay, you'll be surveilled at, at one level uh, in your physical life uh, in unprecedented uh, manners, but still uh, you'll have this secure uh, level as a human with your family and your friends and be able to support those issues and things that of interest to you and find out information and then there'll be this additional layer on top of that where people will be able to innovate in an unprecedented manner to build a new digital future like we've never seen. Well, those uh, inspiring words to end on. So on behalf of everybody, please uh, thank everybody. Uh, thank David for uh, coming to Web Summit. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank Mike. You. This is great. This is a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Pleasure, great. really. Okay. I think we go that, that way, way, I guess. Yeah.